quarter spawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're kind of really, I mean, a day like this back last year, October 6th, we had nasty blue green algae blooms out in the lake. It was bad. It was all over the place, October 6th. Um, yeah, it was kind of just cloudy, just a little drizzle out, and all of a sudden we're getting calls all over the place. I'm driving. It's, it was nuts how, how significant October. it was. October. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's not Monday all... was yeah it was like Monday and then it progressed that by Wednesday um, we just had these three flat calm days um, and the lake temperature was still close to seventy mm -hmm. you know and it just a confluence of factors and um, still trying to be understood you know from at the mm -hmm. federal state local level so. So yeah, no, we're uh, um, the beaches are out of the woods, right? That's it makes it easy that way. But really, September is typically our worst month. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming today, Kevin. On that joyous note, that's right. Yeah, so I'm not happy. <laughs> no. <Nope>. That's right. <laughs> in in person, that's nice to see people in person. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah, nice to see you. Hi, Gary. Howdy. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. Well, Come on well. in. So Kevin is here to uh, give us any updates he might have, and then really, if you have any questions for him. Yeah, I figure you know it's a Tuesday morning after yeah. Labor Day. He doesn't or need to do a We don't need to do a formal. Yeah, yeah it's right. absolutely. And I, I won't flip the script a little. I want to flip it a little bit and kind of come back to you guys as key, you know, components of, of the town of Kennedy and, and reach out to you and ask what are you seeing in terms of. Um, Kind of biggest threats, biggest issues, biggest positives. We got, you know, think positive also about, you know, what are we doing about protecting Canandaigua Lake and, and just thinking through those those aspects. Um, one of the things we're doing right now is updating and adding an addendum to our current watershed plan. Um, it's called the nine element update. Um, I won't bore you with the full nine elements, but what it does is we're looking at um, Kind of gathering more data and we've done a lot of that and working with Cornell University on a computer model to predict um, nutrient loads and um, sediment loads going into the lake from the surrounding drainage area. So that's helping us a little bit. It's one tool in the toolbox to tell us about kind of loads of, of the nutrients and where they're coming from. Um, so what we have to do is, um, and it's quite honestly, it'll help Town of Canada but once we get an approved uh, nine element plan it'll score us significantly higher for grant applications with DEC and other state agencies as they consider these. Um, so that nine element plan, um, you know, we're working through that and one of the, the components is really source water protection, really looking at um, a lot of the projects that we've built and then what more can we do and there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and thinking about, you know, shoreline protection, thinking about upland protection, um, and really implementing those uh, through our nine element plan and then being able to predict um, nutrient load reductions going into the lake. So we're in the midst of doing that um, right now. Cornell, I actually just emailed them again this morning saying we need the results. <laughs> so we're, um, we have an initial round of results. We need the final modeling results from them. And then we're going to get that out to a wider audience of uh, stakeholder groups and you know, start looking at that and, and uh, the plan so and it will be an addendum it'll be probably a 50 ish page addendum to our current plan that we have and in that also we'll we'll add in kind of an update of what we've accomplished over the last uh, seven years since this plan was uh, last adopted by all the municipalities um, so we're working on that um, you know some other big things right now we're just talking about uh, blue green algae issues it's been fairly light this year, I would say. We've, we've been in you know, pretty good shape. The purveyors, um, so Newark, Palmyra, the city of Canandaigua, Rushville, and Gorham have all had non-detect um, uh, levels of the toxin that gets produced by blue green algae uh, in both the raw and the finished water, which is great, obviously, on the finished side, but it's really good to see it on the raw side as well. So before it goes through the treatment process, uh, we're not seeing any detectable levels of the toxin um, getting down um, uh, to 42 feet, which is the city of Kennedy was intake pipe. 
So in 2019, uh, we had a very different year. 2019, we were seeing levels um, twice get into the raw water of the city of Canandaigua's treatment uh, system at 42 feet down um, that would close Onanda Park, close Butler Beach. It was above four micrograms per liter of the toxin associated with um, that's produced by microcystis, the blue green algae of uh, concern that we have um, in this lake. So obviously, you know, that's something of concern. Our treatment system at all the purveying uh, plants have shown that they can do, they can do the job to um, treat the water. Um, even Rushville, they've made some upgrades, but they found later on when they did have their issue in 2017, I think, or 2018, where they had to close the water supply for a day or two. They found they were they were testing the water um, too soon in the treatment process. So they had just sampled the water right after it gotten through the treatment. The key ingredient is chlorine, chlorine contact time. So they should have been sampling just before the first point of, of use. And that would have been enough contact time where it would not have been an issue from a, a public water supply perspective. But, you know, as we look at these things, we think about climate change, we think about, you know, the, the increased storm events, um, potential and reality. Um, this is a threat that's going to be there. And we really need to think about resiliency and, and building in and adapting to these issues. And that's a lot of what we do. I and mean, it's great working with the town of Canandaigua. Um, Jim Fletcher and his crew uh, is awesome. Uh, the town has partnered with the Watershed Council in providing an employee um, through the town. Uh, Ken Brockett, who does, has been a longtime employee, he retired. He came back on and, and we do projects around the watershed. Ken and I, we, we either use town equipment, we either rent equipment, um, and then using grant funds, we can reimburse back to the town on the use of that. And we've built projects down in Naples, in Middlesex, um, in South Bristol, in Gorham, uh, just this year alone, uh, doing that kind of work, doing water quality improvement work. Um, so it's a great partnership, and that's a lot of the positives, and, and we really want to accelerate a lot of those kind of projects and do a lot more of those um, throughout the, the drainage basin. So, you know, in terms of updates, you know, we're, there's a lot of stuff going on at the town level. It's amazing. Just I always enjoy, you know, talking to Doug and the crew here in terms of all the different stuff going on. Um, another big thing is we talk about source water. We talk about resiliency. Um, and we have a source water grant, $680,000 grant um, from New York State um, that um, we're hoping see how it all plays out. Some of that gets used at the RSM project, see how that all shakes out. If that doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but we still have a substantial amount of money either way to use on source water protection. And source water protection happens at the shoreline. That's important. But it, it's as or more important in many ways, if you can do it the right way, um, in the uplands. So. That's something I think as a town we really need to think about, you know, as a town resident and, and uh, you know, basically a 114th employee of the town, right? I think a little bit more than 114th, but uh, um, we look at this and we say, all right, what are some key strategic areas that we can partner with? And the town is really looking at saying, hey, well, you know, be blunt, you know, the Warners have a lot of land for sale, right? Is there key areas that are at the edge of field or at <laughs> along Menti Creek? where we can gain you know, protective uh, measures to really filter the water, retain the water, slow it down so we don't have flooding issues downstream and water quality issues downstream. Um, there's a whole host of possibilities, I think, throughout the town of Canandaigua, um, you know, as we look at that and, and think about these kind of issues. So that's a grant that's out there. We're looking for project sites. Um, actively looking at that. I'm going to do a decent amount of that this fall. We've got a couple project sites in the town of Gorham that are small, three, four acres, um, edge of field, deep run area, where we're going to work with a farmer there and they're going to take a little bit of the land out of production where a lot of the landscape washes through on these heavier events. And they're willing to take that land out of production as long as we compensate them. Mm -hmm. And this grant is going to be used to compensate the farmer for that lost land 
Um, and the key thing is we want to make sure and the land there that is going to be taken out of production is of marginal quality in terms of farm production. Some years it's good, you know, in a droughty year like this year, it probably would be okay, but in a wetter year, it you can't even get tractors through it. So those are the kind of landscapes that if we we're going to take land out of production, it's got a high ecological services, a high natural capital value, where we can get a lot of water quality treatment as well. So, you know, we think about that and we think about, you know, projects like we did with a handshake deal, quite honestly, with the Warners, back about 10 years ago now, um, just above, um, just south of Menti, they have land just above up in that area where the water um, was coming off their farm field. They weren't doing anything you know, wrong per se. You know, there could have been things done better, no doubt about it, but they weren't doing you know, things you know, dramatically wrong. But the types of events we were having, we were getting water washing across that road <clears throat> on multiple occasions in 2010, 2012, 13, and they worked with us and they handshake deal. They agreed to put 10 acres of that land above um, um, this area, um, took it out of production, um, and then said, okay, we'll make it a hay field. So they kept it as a permanent hay field the last 10 years, even though it probably should have rotated out to a row crop by now. They kept it as a hay field to retain the, the soil structure there, reduce the the runoff factor, and then they worked with us to allow us to put in a sod, literally a sod um, grass swale system going through that area. So that's just one small example, and that has yielded huge results because Fletcher would have to go out there, the county would have to go out there, the water main was um, in, there was concern about that being washed out. The county was doing engineering studies to have to replace it multiple hundred thousand dollars to replace the culverts, to increase the culvert size. The landowners were getting flooded out. And by doing this work holistically with the farmer, um, and they didn't get compensated on this. They just agreed to do it. They just thought it was the right thing to do. And they had trust with George. And George helped me gain trust with the Warners also, George Barden, our former watershed inspector. Um, that trust factor was huge in working with them and, and partnering with them. And that's the key thing in all of this. Um, to me, there's talk over in the Alaska Watershed Basin of regulating farming operations, smaller farming operations, requiring things that are, are really done more so at the state level, but really ramping up those regulations on the farming community. And there was a lot of blowback in the Alaska Watershed. My goal, my hope is we can avoid that approach here, really, really avoid that approach. I don't think it's the right approach. Um, but really avoid that that type of approach with our farming community. Um, and they, they drafted a set of rules and regulations on farming operations requiring setbacks, requiring no fertilization zones, kind of a cookie cutter approach in my opinion in many ways, um, requiring riparian buffers. And those are all great in theory, but they may not make sense all the time in all in different farm farmsteads. So we're looking at that and thankfully the, actually the state's doing the right thing. They're going to take another year. It's been at the state and they've gotten ag and markets involved, Department of Health, DEC, and they're reviewing those draft regulations and they can't enforce them until the state health department approves them. And the state health department's not going to approve them until they get the feedback they need from ag and markets and others. My take is we should be partnering. We should be figuring out how do we compensate properly? How do we work with our farmers? How do we figure out putting in these buffers, putting in edge of field solutions right near roadside ditches um, and doing those kind of things. So like again, other areas like on Dual Road and, and the projects we've done here in Sucker Brook, um, just down the road and elsewhere. So those are the kind of things I think we as a town, we could have major, major benefits um, from a source water perspective, from protecting town infrastructure, and really, you know, protecting the green infrastructure of Canandaigua Lake. Oh, go to the next question. Yeah. Um, 2015, 16 timeframe, Tom and I joined you with a group uh, of all the different representatives of all the different municipalities. And we were, we kept talking about the dirty six. Remember in the, of the six most pollutants to Canandaigua Lake. And that was, we did the septic law at that time. And we did steep slope. Whatever happened, did the other municipalities do it and then 
I don't. What were the other? Yeah, I had heard that term before. I'm trying to remember hearing that term, the dirty six, before. But uh, um, so in terms of the on-site law, so Town of Kennedy adopted it, South Bristol adopted it, uh, Middlesex and Gorham. So Town of Italy, which has a very small portion of the um, shoreline, uh, maybe 20, 30 homes down there on Sunnyside, has not as of yet. Um, they might, but we have 35 and a half of the 36 short uh, six miles of shoreline um, protected with the on-site law. City's obviously sewered, um, so they didn't need that law. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a you know a nice accomplishment that way. Steep slope law, um, South Bristol has one. You and Middlesex have a um, you know pretty significant steep slope law. I would say they're they're pretty comparable. Um, you know some of the other things, stormwater management. Uh, you don't see this much across New York State, but Town of Kennedy were adopted 10, 15 years ago. You know we were insisting you know really encouraging this and. And the city did the same thing, and that's our, really our growth towns. When you look at it, Gore, and Gorham does this as well. They require enhanced phosphorus treatment of any new development, um, any large development within the watershed. So that's a key thing. So it requires, instead of the state minimum standards for stormwater um, control and treatment, it requires a higher level of phosphorus removal um, by the pond systems and the green infrastructure that's put in on these development sites. Um, I know one of the ones that I thought that we never really went back to visit it was the shoreline stuff. Um, we have guidelines, I guess, that are codified uh, in the town, but, mm -hmm. as you know, but it's like, should there be a more uniform approach to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uniformity, I think, is good in some ways. Docks and moorings, I think, is critical to have that as a, you know, a uniform law. And that's another area that we have worked with Chris Jensen and, and some others where we have a a draft set of updates that's on my list to get out to the shoreline, you know, communities and let's sit down and go through that and, and really review that. My goal, and it's not intentional, but it's just we have so many other things going on, is it's probably fall for the code enforcement officers. It might be a little bit easier with construction season winding down to sit down and really go through what we're looking at there and then draft it a little bit more so and then be ready for getting out to the public and, and talking through it um, over the you know, maybe the spring months and and you know going for final adoption hopefully next summer would be my thought there for for docks and moorings um so shoreline components you know it, it's an we rely on dec up to the mean high water mark so 689.4 feet above sea level like typically like right now it's a little lower it's 687.8 roughly this morning um, so DEC has regulatory authority up to 689.4, and they're very restrictive in terms of their their requirements. But what about from you know from that shoreline mean high water mark edge going up? And there's an assortment of approaches, um, which is good, I think, because we can kind of learn from each other. Um, you know, Gorham I think has a 25 foot setback. Sometimes, you know, I wonder, you know, is it fully being implemented all the time? You know, there's in terms of requiring a vegetative zone, but I think a lot of Gorham has just already been built that you don't really see that, you know, you're not going to require a reestablishment of a vegetative zone, but if there is one there, then you've got to keep it. Um, so there's those kind of buffers, um, but we have not gone down that route of, of writing you know, model regulations on that, but that would be interesting. I think a core group of maybe looking at that that aspect. So, um, any any more specifics on that in terms? Of I I don't remember the other one. Okay. I remember just all the different ones that we're looking at. I know I have my yeah. notes. But well, we have uh, thirteen management categories right, here yeah. that we can <laughs> talk about. So I don't limit it to, to right. six. Right? Yeah. So well, you, you know, know, and the other thing that we did uh, just fairly recently, our ordinance committee, and I think it came out of group, this group and conversations like this, is our new scenic view shed overlay, which yep. specifically it's the map above your head there, everybody right. in the purple, it now requires a one acre lot size, yep. you know, to really try to limit development in those areas that, uh, that prevent mm -hmm. that dense development mm -hmm. in those areas. Yeah, I, I know we had drafted a set of Ridgeline regulations Oh, five, six years ago, and that yeah. it just seemed like that was going to be too intense. Right. Um, and, you know, I live on a ridge line. So it's, um, you know, it was one of those things looking at it, trying to find that balance. 
you know, what's, what's the right approach, what's the right balance of requiring certain things. Um, so I do think, you know, the one acre approach is a, is a good solid, I'll say, start, in my opinion. You know, it, it doesn't say you can't, you know, it's not limiting what you can do, you know, just saying the only thing, the only limit is you must have one acre. A subdivision must be at least one acre. Right. So, um, but I by do, default, it would eliminate apartments or yes. homes, those types of things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is. Yeah. Do other towns have similar restrictions uh, related to viewship? For you know, they really don't. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things. Yeah, like Gorham I think has a little bit in place, mm -hmm. um, but there's not that aspect. And again, it was one of those things we had to be careful. So as a watershed council, one, we're non-regulatory. So who I work for are the 14 municipalities around the lake and, and the, you know, the, includes the five purveyors. Um, our goal, our role is water quality. View shed, scenic, you know, vistas, you know, is part of, you know, you think about the whole package of what we all try to do here as a program or what, you know, in terms of protecting the lake, protecting that view is part of our quality of life. It's just a little bit, it's not, I, I can directly relate it to water quality when you look at disturbance and, right. you know, and just wholesale destruction of the hillside area, that kind of stuff is, is one thing. Yeah. Um, and runoff factors associated with it. But it gets a little gray area. Get into the aesthetics. Yeah, when, yeah some of the yeah. stuff I was writing, I'm like, oh, yeah, just got to be on. So it's, yeah, so I do think, you know, we were looking at, all right, do we try to set back? You know, do we try to set the, the house lower on instead of on the ridge line, set it down low. Well, what happens at a ridge line? Well, it drops off. Now we're putting homes in a steep slope area that's requiring more disturbance, right? right? So there's unintended consequences of certain <clears throat> aspects. So, you know, then it's looking at, you know, vegetative, you know, ma ma maintaining vegetative aspects. And as Chris Jensen, it's very difficult mm -hmm. after you're done developing and, you know, building permit and, Certificate of occupancy is, is approved. Well, what what carrot do you have at that point? What's the idea at that point? So there's those kind of things as well. So you know, from an on-site wastewater system, I think we've got a, a very strong law. I think shoreline regs we could probably look at a little bit more and and figure out what's a good balance. You know, and I don't know if, if there's any of the committees here that are looking at that a little bit more closely or okay, all right. Um, Mostly that ship sailed. Yeah. Well, I think the, the planning board, and, and obviously Kevin provides a lot of guidance to the planning board, but you know, as they're reviewing applications, even coming up with other creative solutions instead of a hard wall, right? Uh, they're repairing buffers. So or DEC the, uh, is doing that now. Typically, right at that yeah. water's edge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but it's really you know that that first 20 or so feet at the shoreline area is kind of critical. If you've got this manicured, beautiful mowed lawn right down to the mean high water mark, well, you know, you get good runoff events, well, it's carrying whatever you last put down onto that landscape. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a high probability. So, you know, we, we look at those kind of things and, and try to figure what's that balance, what's the right approach there. And, um, so, but what we're also seeing, we're seeing a lot of redevelopment, right? We're seeing a lot of expansion, a lot of requests for variances, a lot of, of these kind of aspects. And um, that's the time, you know, in Gorham, it's interesting. They do say any new impervious cover, you must have a, some sort of stormwater management system put in place um, to manage that increased impervious cover, try to get water quality treatment to it. And I think, the town of Kennedy was done that to a certain extent, but I think there's a certain threshold of either impervious cover or disturbance before that that kicks in. Um, so that might be something to look at. You know, requiring you know some sort of infiltration device, some sort of um, rain guard. Is Gorham's based? It's not based on square footage at all. It's just any. Any. Yeah. Any. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's uh. And I'll see. Uh, I'm actually going to be riding down to South Bristol with Tom Harvey in a little bit, um, mm -hmm. going to visit down there. And uh, I'll say with Tom's the, the planning board chair down there. So sometimes it's what Tom decides <laughs> within the realm, within the realm, Tom, if you're listening, right? 
<laughs> but you know, it's fine. Um, I would say it to his face. So it's, you know, Tom does a really good job of kind of working with the applicants um, and figuring out getting to some sort of solution point there. Um, but I think there's a nice, there, there is a good strength in that approach of saying, okay, more impervious cover, um, you need a water quality treatment approach here. The question becomes, are they maintained? You know, I've seen a lot of pervious pavement not be maintained, and it is now impervious. You know, if you do not if you do not maintain it, it becomes useless. It will just run off. All the pore space there just gets filled in, and it, um, so that's, that's that's the next that's yeah. the challenge, right? Yeah. Because I know this comes up quite frequently, and and I expect this is going to be coming up again here pretty soon with the ordinance committee. Is do you allow for greater lot coverage if they're going to do pervious pavement and it's it's easy to say well yeah that's that's not a problem but exactly what you just said we've had so many examples in the town of canada and i'll pick on randy farnsworth for a second his dealership right that was all pervious pavement they sealed it before a gm visit it started flooding well then all of a sudden he has a flooding issue well of course he has a flooding issue because yeah. he sealed it right it's impossible for us to regulate. Right. To yeah. go to design all that drainage on the oh, yeah, underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> now, amazing? so now he's actually re-engineering the whole thing to actually redo it again. And I'll yeah. pick on Randy. Randy will be here Thursday for our LDC <laughs> meeting. But it, it, it's what happens. Yeah. And so there's no way for us to stay on top of every one of those circumstances by giving these credits for the pervious payment right. and then making sure they stay right. pervious. They're correct. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know at the micro level of the individual lot that's difficult, and <coughs> as we've experienced, it's also difficult even at the macro larger development scale of right. <coughs> maintaining these stormwater facilities. Um, you look at that, and you say, all right, what? We have a hodgepodge approach here, quite honestly, in the town of Canada, and it's not it's not a negative. It's sort of it's been a lot of learning, a lot of evolution of figuring out, all right, what makes the most sense? Should we storm water district the whole thing? Should we storm water district any new development? Should we rely on the homeowners associations to handle stormwater management? You know, and it, I always get worried about putting, like if it's a private road system, my suggestion is <coughs> you don't do a stormwater district because you're putting public utility, you're putting trucks, you're putting equipment. Mm -hmm potentially up into that area. Um, unless you have some sort of access easement that does not rely on the private uh, road system. Um, but otherwise, I'm a big believer in any of these new developments of that, you know, we as a town need to, you know, somewhat, you know, make sure we, we fund these things the right way, but we have a, uh, a district for most new developments that are public road systems. Um, I think it's, it will, reduce headaches, relying on homeowners associations that sometimes function, sometimes don't function, sometimes have ulterior motives based on the crew that's in charge at that time, you know, quite honestly. So I think there's a way, if we're going to be maintaining these critical systems to do what they're supposed to be doing, um, we have the infrastructure, the highway personnel, and we have it funded properly through these districts to handle those um, and, and you get a little bit more of a uniform performance from those. Have, haven't we solved, kind of solved that problem about private roads and HOAs and once they're over X number of dwellings on a private road driveway or whatever, well, but but the horses are out of the barn by yet. solved. It's <laughs> not solved, but we continue to make progress. So at the next town board meeting, the law is back relative to if it's more than three units would have to the road would have to be uh, built to town specifications um, that would then be maintained by the town and, and all that stuff. Um, we do have in terms of the new developments with HOAs, we have a stormwater management facility agreement that we require with any new development that if they don't take care of it, we go in and do it and then we, we tax them, we okay. can charge them. Yeah. So that's a legal document. That's, that's a critical mechanism. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. you know, all of those. 
give them the chance to take care of it first. Right. And if they don't, we have the ability to go right. Because I remember it was that was a problem in Old Brookside. It was trying right. to figure oh, that you know. Yeah, it's a classic. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But down the road, if people deviate from their original plan, the town is empowered to go yes. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. The big thing we see is you know people, and we've seen this in Gorham where they're you know. Even in, um, you know, they're putting sheds or they're um, putting berms or some sort of obstruction in the swale system. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to use every inch of their property, right? Especially in smaller lot uh, subdivisions, which you know it's it's understandable, you know, in, in theory. Why you know, oh, I want to put the shed back there so it's out of the way. Well, it's in the low spot, and that flow when it's you know an inch in an hour. We need that swell, yeah. you know, and, and then it creates problems and diverting flow and, and things like that. So it's, that's got to be part of, um, you know, the system as well. How, I hope I can phrase this right. Um, what about the other lakes around us? I mean, do they look at what we're doing, our practices, and, you know, tr try to adapt it to their situation? Yeah, I think there's been a really good evolution of management on the other lakes over the last 10 years or so. I think Seneca Lake, um, you know, they're going through the same process we are right now. They're a nine element plan. They partnered with Cuca Lake because Cuca drains into Seneca through the Cuca Outlet. They're working together on developing their nine element uh, watershed <coughs> plan. Um, you know, they. The one difference I would say that we have that's somewhat unique here uh, compared to the other Finger Lakes is that we have all 14 municipalities sitting together as a watershed council um, working together. You, there's various levels of success in the other lakes. Canisius, you know, you're talking five municipalities, I think. It's really run more so through the county. Um, the decision was made early on with, with my position and the overall program was they didn't want to see my position be in the county somewhere because if and this happens sometimes most recently in naples and elsewhere if the county and a municipality is not getting along well if i'm going down there all oh, you're with the county right so it's really nice to be directly connected you know to the municipalities and have those municipalities sit as my collective boss um to be able to go in there so that's a unique feature that i think we have um, but there's a lot of good stuff going on and a lot of things to celebrate. Our citizen group, the Watershed Association, does a huge amount of educational outreach work. We, we work with them on some of those things, partner financially on some of those aspects, but they're really good at, you know, the outreach, at the, you know, working with folks in terms of getting them information and celebrating what we do around here and stuff. Um, and then they've partnered with a lot of the other lake organizations across the Finger Lakes and formed a regional watershed alliance uh, for the Finger Lakes to to lobby for certain things and to share educational resources like the Lake Friendly uh, Lawn Care Program. That's something we've worked on with the association a lot, but they've really taken it and really you know, get it out there with, with publications and stuff. So, um, so I think it's always we're learning from each other you know, and I think there's a, a lot of that going on. One of the things, from what I understand, you know, we, we do things a lot more project type stuff than, than other municipal or other um, watershed councils, if you will. We actually are hands on. We take on a lot of big projects and um, do a lot of that. And that's really thanks, quite honestly, to the town of Canandaigua having the equipment and the crew available and us being able to reimburse wherever and whenever we can. For that that aspect, so it, it's right. um, you know I call Fletch and uh, you know I'll get sometimes I'll get some grumbling and then he's figuring out all right when when can we fit this in or um, you know so it, it but it works out really well. Great, thanks, so, you know, Kevin. We had uh, identified I think you had identified eight different spots, a lot of them in the town of Canandaigua, where we were doing water quality improvement projects. We've obviously done two. There's still mm -hmm. some money there. Be fun anything more. I know what well, we've it's done three is a change. Yes, yeah, so yeah. rural development, you know, oh, that, true. Yeah. 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 So um and then you know we've identified, you know, early on, you know, we gave those locations to uh, that Hobart class and you know we, we had identified them for them and said, hey, you know, do some evaluation, it was a good educational project for them. Um but I think 
so there is you guys still have money available you know for, for um, the funding that came so just to back up a little bit the city and the town of Canada would join forces um, the city I think put in 175,000 the town put $150,000 in we had state grant dollars and we did two big projects one in County Road 30 um, and then one in 5 and 20 here and both projects have worked very well during these medium to large storm events are really providing flood control and water quality treatment um, and then we did a riparian zone and a wetland uh, protection aspect on rural development. There's five other spots that have been identified. Um, and I think some of it, we were running into some landowner issues of not having real interest in um, partnering with us for an easement. Um, I think the first one, yeah, we did with Mrs. Palacini up here. And that would took about five minutes. Sure. All right. You got it. Yeah, you, you can have an easement. Uh, I think what she said, as long as you can promise no snakes come up to my, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I'm <laughs> so, is one of those projects Sucker Brook? Yeah, within Sucker Brook, we identified eight locations within Sucker Brook for possible water quality treatment, flood control protection. You know, so one would be um, County Road 32, as you're dropping down, um, there's land just south of that area. Um, there's a another spot. And that had been a project here because I remember you giving a, a talk to us once before about those project areas. Yeah, so that one, you know, again, I think it's more of a landowner aspect of not really being interested in easements or giving up land in that area. Because isn't that still a problem? Uh, you know, after every rainfall, there's no way I'd stick my toe in that lake at the north end because it is just. Yeah. Really, really brown. <laughs> yeah, coming in. Yeah, so yes. there's a comedy, like some of the, one of the storms that we had um, mm -hmm. that really hit the town and city of Canada were pretty hard, whereas south end of the lake, they really got zero rain. You know, mm -hmm. it was really interesting just watching the diversity of the rainfall amounts. Um, it was interesting, I think I, I was talking to, to Jim, I was talking to Doug. Um, we had um, issues on the rural development site. We had issues at the YMCA. But then what I did is I went upstream of both of those locations. I'm like, all right, well, what does the water look like coming in? That's so we looked at the County Road 30 site, and that was pretty brown too coming in. So you've got a lot of that farmland runoff. You know, the farm fields, even when they're doing you know a lot of good practices, especially you know certain times a year, the fields they just can't handle it. You know, so all that rain coming in. Part of the education should be that Canandaigua Lake provides water from here all the way to Lake Ontario. And it's it's crucial that we keep that water right. potable. Yeah. So when you when you have these events mm -hmm. um that really is working against you all the time. But the, I mean yeah. I was flabbergasted to learn that, and first of all, and I was flabbergasted to learn that Candago Lake is higher than any of the other places, and that the water, you know, of course, goes downhill. Um, but well, we don't serve all the way up to Lake Ontario, right? right? We, with Newark, and, Newark yeah. and Palmyra yeah, right. take water. Yep. yep. Um, so, and, and that's quite a distance oh, it away. Is. Yes. <laughs> that's yep. quite a distance. And it is downhill, away. so yeah. And it is down. I said right. downhill system, yep. right? Yep. So. Isn't it important to have all of those municipalities in on the information part of it? Because I frankly don't think they are. Oh, they are. Yeah, they sit on the Watershed Council. Newark and Palmyra are on the Watershed Council. Marty Amon uh, from Palmyra, Wayne County Water Authority is great. Um, he's the executive director. He sits on the, the Watershed Council. And then Mike Gonzalez, who runs the, uh, the Newark plant, is on the Watershed Council as well. So yeah, they've been they're big contributors okay. into our program mm -hmm. um, each and every year, um, and yeah, they play a very important role for sure. And then they also play an important role in the other part of the overall watershed program, which is the inspection program. Okay. Um, both Newark and Palmyra are part of that as well, and financially contribute to that. Well, both Newark and Palmyra is a little bit of help, in my opinion. Um, but uh, that's yeah. a different story because they have that that dirty canal running through them. So. Uh. <laughs> Both of those, uh, the 5 and 20 and the County Road 30 uh, water quality improvement projects Kevin was talking about, um, 
both of those, we've seen those full of water at different times. So not only helping to keep some of the sediment out of the lake, but also remember all the flooding that used to happen? Yes, yes. The, yeah. the, I don't think I haven't heard of any real flooding, no. not yeah. major issues. I mean, right. Those that. will work up to about that 10 year storm event level. Mm -hmm. You know, you get above that, they'll, they'll provide benefit, but the system upstream is going to overwhelm and go down through. So that's why we're looking at more of those Spots, but again, we can't just focus in on Suckerbrook. There's, you know, there's a bunch of possibilities in Tishner and Manteith and, and a lot of the smaller drainage systems. Well, I mean, you, yep. you can actually see from any brook that enters yep. into the lake uh, after an event, there, there is uh, it's pretty bad coloring. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, yes. and that is, you know, and again, there is going to be that natural background level, but, you know, especially, you know, the model shows us our my opinion more importantly our long-term water quality sampling programs also documents that yes you know the egg dominated sub watersheds you see are the higher nutrient and sediment loading coming from those areas yes um, one of the things we did down in again this is where the town of canada we helped out tremendously with town of naples nature conservancy the watershed council got the grant we just did a project over the last year and a half two years of work down in Naples Creek, which 25% of the water that flows into the lake is draining through Naples Creek and through this uh, this project area. Um, and this is maybe one I should have brought a map on, but what we did is there's a bunch of landowners, including large CAFO operation down there, Schumacher's right down in the flats, and Jeremy Fields. Um, we had a, a cast of characters um, involved to make a project come together where um, we had donated easements. We, um, we were allowed to extend an agricultural ditch about 600 feet um, to take floodwaters. DOT was involved um, where we put large culvert systems underneath 245 where it used to flood. The Nature Conservancy bought uh, 80 acres of land down there. Um, and what we've done along all of these systems that was all bermed off or either by the roads or by um, uh, previous uh, work in the stream system, we've reestablished the floodplain system in there tremendously. So what would happen is, except in the most extreme storm in some of these areas that we would want to flood now because we either purchased it or the DEC owns it, um, wasn't flooding. And it would flood in the ag fields and carry all of that material yeah. out further down. So what we've done is we've put in, I think we're at about 13 burn breaks along Naples Creek and to allow the water to get out of Naples Creek when it's really cranking. And then some of the tributary systems that are draining the ag fields, we also put in burn breaks to get the water out into more of a natural area um, where that donated, we have like 110 acres of easements down there or land uh, purchase that was not there before and we're flooding those areas. So we're getting huge water quality treatment in those 110 acres. And then we put a bunch of burn breaks and culverts um, on state land to allow the water to get out into the hundreds of acres of high tor wetland system that the water would bypass. So we're now taking, I would say we're probably somewhere in the 400 acre range roughly, give or take 50 acres of land that we're now able to flood and gain water quality treatment that we weren't able to before. So on these smaller events, these two to five year storm events that we get a lot of, um, and we're now flooding those systems with sediment, nutrient, bacteria laden water and let nature do the treatment. So that's been a huge project and a huge success story for us that's taken a lot of time and effort to, to build that in. So my opinion mm -hmm. and many people's opinion having portable <clears throat> water is a real asset yeah. and no one in the united states of america should not have portable right. water but jackson mississippi doesn't yeah. have portable water flint michigan doesn't have portable water <clears throat> they they have water around them yeah. but it's not portable mm -hmm. so is limiting um building uh Developments, uh, home building septic systems, because they're still around Canandaigua Lake, it's not fully sewer, um, or even sewer systems. This limiting development, wouldn't that have a more positive effect 
uh, maintaining the quality of the water in Candango Lake, then I understand yeah. that some of the, the natural things, and I, I absolutely agree that that's mm -hmm. really important, but it seems like everybody wants development. You know, everybody wants, well, let's have houses. I've got a morale development. How many houses are in the morale development? Like 400? All in a farm field. Does, isn't it important to impress upon people that we have a natural resource here that many thousands of people are dependent upon? And if we don't pay attention, they're going to suffer. Right. I, I think everyone would agree with what you're saying in terms of potable water is probably, if not the top, it's got to be within the top two, right, <laughs> of what we need around here. Um, and, um, and it, it, you know, what we have in terms of this chosen spot, in terms of what we have in this lake, really is um, it's what has drawn a lot of people here, and it's what creates some of the development pressure, right? Is I that, understand that. So how do, we, yeah. how do we balance that out, right? Mm -hmm. So the projects we do quite honestly, um, in a lot of these areas is, is sort of that net benefit, you know, from an accounting system perspective, call it environmental accounting. So yes, development is going to have, say, you know, somewhat of a negative impact. How do we mitigate that? Well, we mitigate it on site with enhanced phosphorus treatment, stormwater regulations. We, in, we, we mitigate it with limiting the amount of development that can occur on that overall land area. We require open space aspects. We require certain components to be done. Trees, you know, the landscape, the, the drainage features, all of that has to work on that site. The other thing we've done, um, we also look at and say, okay, we still know we'd much rather have a forested area there than, than that, right? So how do we mitigate some of that and balance out property rights and development rights and, and things along those lines? So it's, it's purchasing open space like the town does. It's doing these projects, which quite honestly, I mean, we're pulling uh, I would say 100 million gallons of water at the very least into this Naples Creek system mm -hmm. during any any one of these major you know uh, or moderate sized storm events. It's flowing through, or we're getting huge treatment from that. So by you know putting in these other buffer systems, the goal is net reduction, net um, um, uh, reduction of, of the impacts going to lake. Our long term sampling program indicates and we contract with FLCC to do this, that our phosphorus levels are static, if not slightly decreasing over time. Why do we have these blue-green algae blooms? That's a whole nother aspect. But that's telling us that's a really good indicator that, all right, at least we're not enriching the lake. We're not, and phosphorus is the key driver of algae growth. So, so that is a good sign that I would say overall, holistically, of, what we're doing in the plan, what the municipalities are doing, the projects and all those kind of things are showcasing, hey, hey, we're not making things worse around here. In fact, we're at a level of phosphorus going you know, into lake and what's shown up in the concentrations of, you know, five <clears throat> micrograms per liter. That's really good. That's, that's where you would want it to be for a lake like ours. It's, it's a great concentration. It supports a fishery, but it's, it's, you know, up until seven years ago, DEC and lake scientists would tell you, oh, there's no way you would have algae blooms with, with five yeah. micrograms per liter of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Typically 20 was the level you would expect. Maybe <laughs> you would start to see it. And we were, you know, we're one of the lowest, like um, Skinny Ellis Lake, Cuca Lake, and our lake were typically the long-term phosphorus sampling was showing that our lakes were, you know, the lowest. Yeah. In, in 2019, when we had a bloom, was there any of the nutrient analysis that sort of stood out as? Different? So that's, so the confounding factor is, is we had some of the lowest phosphorus years on record um, during some of the biggest bloom years. Mm -hmm. So there's other factors that are involved. Phosphorus still plays a role, especially pulses of phosphorus <clears throat> coming in from rain events and stuff can be a factor. But some of the other big change factors we've seen around here are um, quagga mussels coming into the lake and increasing lake temperatures. So those two factors seem to be the big driver of changing and making the ecosystem much more fragile and much more susceptible mm -hmm. to blue green algae. Temperature, 
subtle changes in temperature can make it more advantageous for certain types of algae, in this case, microcystis, blue green algae, to really dominate. <clears throat> I think, and I think there's a lot more literature and science being done that quagga mussels are playing the biggest factor. Because what they do through the whole growing season is that, and they, they basically largely replace the zebra mussels. Mm -hmm. So about 90% of the quagga zebra mussel biomass is, is quagga mussels now. So zebra mussels came in in 96 time frame, and you can see a clearing of the water uh, but they typically tap out um, lake depth wise around 70 feet. Their reproduction rates are, you know, a certain amount, you know, and you can see um, some impacts from that. Um, but what zebra mussels and quagga mussels both do, and the quagga mussels came in around 2011, 2012, and they really began to take off and replace the zebra mussels largely. So by 2015, we started seeing the, our first blooms. What they do is they filter feed all the good algae. They like the green algae, the diatoms, that kind of stuff. That's what they feed on. They actually regurgitate the blue-green algae. They don't like the taste of it. They find it unpalatable. So they're spitting out um, the, uh, the microcystis. And the microcystis, which is the blue-green algae of concern in our lake, it's a cyanobacteria, they have buoyancy control. So not only are they getting a competitive advantage by the quagga mussels selectively filter feeding out the competition for the available nutrients. They're also with buoyancy control. They can drop down at night and work off of the excrement that the quagga mussels are putting out, which is dissolved phosphorus, ready available phosphorus. So they can move up and down the water column. So at night they go down and get the little bit of, you know, the phosphorus that's coming off the, the lake bed from the quagga mussels. And perfect then they can system. work. It is. It's, it's perfectly set up for them. So that any additional stuff that we're putting into the lake just further feeds that yeah. system. So our level of control of this, you know, through watershed activities has diminished because of that. It's still important for a variety of reasons, you know, not just phosphorus, but we have to look at a lot of things. We really want to reduce, you know, whatever we can going into the lake. But the reality of the situation is that the quagga mussels have really kind of screwed up the system in a way to to favor microcystis, favor this, this blue green algae. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the struggle of, of this aspect. Mm -hmm. you know, so it might be, we might see why do we have a light year this year? Like 2018, we had a really heavy year of um, blue green algae blooms. It was, it was bad. And it started mid August and we had multiple events. Well, you look back at the rain records, 2018 was pretty dry. Mm -hmm which screwed us up because 2016, 2015 was a pretty wet year. We had pretty heavy blooms that year. It was our first year, pretty bad blooms. So we thought, oh, for sure, it's correlated to watershed runoff. 2016, we had really light blooms, like almost non-existent, and it was a very dry year. Okay, yeah, this is really making sense. 2017, same thing, heavy rain and some significant blooms, not major, but significant. And 2018, pretty dry. But yet we had our worst bloom year, so that was like, all right, well, what, what, you know, what's going on here? And there was more and more literature coming out of the Great Lakes Basin where quagga mussel was really established first. That they're one of the main drivers of the system. So, um, yeah, it's a definitely complex. You know, I wish it was as easy as okay, we build these projects, we're, we'll be in good shape. But it's, you know, but again, we want to make sure it's not just all about phosphorus. We need to think about pesticides. We need to think about other nutrients, mm -hmm. sediment going into the lake, bacteria going into the lake, all of those things. Yeah. Um, the other chemicals of concern, you know, PFAS and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, Karen, you brought up development and I just want to comment real quick for us here guys where so with the exception of the one on 364, all of the town's development, RSM, Lakeside, the Hillcrest area, Fox Ridge, Lakewood Meadows, those were all preliminary approved prior to 2015. But there's been nothing since 2015 in terms of new <coughs> development that's been approved by the town of Canandaigua. And we continue to layer on additional regulations, the steep slope, the scenic view shed, uh, um, even the law that was passed a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago, where we're saying no new infrastructure south of County Road 30 and north of Knott Road and that whole area. I mean, all of those things. And then like the newest one that we're talking about next in terms of the developments, 
those additional layers of regulation and really trying to the strategic friendly protection overlay, just trying to steer the developer to an area like uptown and away from away from the lake. And, I, and, I, and I realize I realize that that's, yeah. that's happening. Um, and I'm not anti-development, no, as you know. I, um, I am very pro potable water. That's right. And right. I, yeah. I have worked in a third world country yeah. to to give them water, mm -hmm. and people in Nicaragua are happy to have water from a spigot ten foot from the front door. That's potable water for them. God forbid. I mean, Jackson, Mississippi doesn't even have that. And so here we are, a fully developed country, and we're not able to maintain the systems that are required for a fully developed country. Well, I would, and I'm not saying we, I'm politics, not saying we. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not saying we here. Mm -hmm. I, I am so thankful that we have a watershed uh, organization that I wish would have more uh, visibility in the entire area that this particular watershed serves. Um, so I know you have visibility in Canada, and I, I've seen it in Naples and some, some of the smaller municipalities. But I know you have no visibility in Palmyra and Newark. <laughs> well, though, I'm not, we're not going to work up there. No, but, I yeah, know, yeah. Like, you the, should because they get their water. Oh, the, well, they there. have their own. They they have governmental agencies that work with well, with them. Trust me, they don't. Have no, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, you know, they pay into a program here, and they participate, you know, from their elected officials in a program here that they quite honestly don't have to. But they choose to. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, but. yeah, and they, they pay in significantly. They're probably in, both are in the top five in terms of annual contributions to the Watershed Council okay. is from Newark and Palmyra. Good, but, I so. stand corrected. Good, I'm glad um, to hear that. How how important are stream setbacks? That's uh, the frequent re request yeah. in developments for variances there. Yeah. So you know, overall stream setbacks from a development perspective, I think are 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 important, but not all streams are equal and and that's the tough part of a regulation you know the 100 foot setback aspect you know it sounds really good in theory and, and i i like it but it's tough to you know to truly um enforce that on every stream you know and, and what's what size stream you know we we looked at drainage area aspects and that was one of the recommendations that, that made it through and um so there are certain areas that i would say um, we looked like, say, Tishner Point is a good example. They had, I'd say, 800 plus feet of riparian buffer that is greater than 100 feet setback. Mm -hmm. They had about a, a 30 to 40 foot stretch where they're pinching in um, and getting pretty close to the stream within, I think, 35 feet of the stream. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things, and they, the rationale that they were using and visiting the site multiple times it made sense to me because there were other large trees on the other side that they were trying to protect and still put in the house that they were looking to put in. And I'm like, all right, well, they're protecting 700 plus feet of riparian buffer. They're going to enhance it. They're going to put plantings. They're doing those kind of things. So I think that's where that, that balancing act has to come into play is, all right, a little bit of intrusion here. Now, the problem I had with it, and they made some alterations to it, was it's exactly where we saw water jumping out of the stream previously. Mm. And I'm like, all right, well, you're putting your pool <laughs> right where we've seen ice jams and debris coming out. So they made some adjustments based yeah. off of that. So it was a good process. Mm. Um, Menteith is another example of trying to figure out, all right, where do we, you know, as you place your house, your structure, making sure you don't create this unintended consequence of flooding your own home or flooding, um, neighbors because of you know obstructions that you're putting in the other big thing is especially when you get close to the lake is putting these houses you know it's a regulatory requirement that chris has to enforce you've got to get up out of the floodplain all right well when you do that there's an unintended consequence of maybe you're going to alter the, the flood balance of how the water disperses out during these storm events so all of those things have to be looked at um so that's where you know as a general rule yes you know, maintain that stream setback, yes. Mm -hmm. 
from an agricultural aspect, it's interesting. A lot of times, you know, that's where this cookie cutter regulation says, all right, we need a 35 foot stream setback uh, buffer, no, no farming within 35 feet. Well, a lot of times, um, most of that field isn't yeah. draining into the stream there. So that buffer is providing little to no benefit, quite mm -hmm. honestly. You'd much rather see, so the head, um, the headland and everything else is forcing that water to come into a, a very small portion of the stream. We see mm -hmm. this all over the place. So that's where you really need to protect sure. the landscape and put in some sort of feature there that says, all right, let's protect it right here. Mm -hmm. um, there's many areas that, in the town of Canada where I'd love to see <clears throat> that type of system put in place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So stream setbacks, I think from a development perspective, I think they do matter. Is 100 feet too much sometimes? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Um, I, but, you know, I, I, and it sounds weird for me to say that, right? Um, but I think there's, um, there's ways to balance that out. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to figure out so you don't have to force a variance process. Yeah. Thanks. I had one question, Kevin, before we wrap up. The stormwater or source water protection money, yep. is that a match? How does that work? It's 75 25. Okay. Yep, 75 state, 25 local. And quite honestly, we looked at <laughs> the RSM one was a beauty because it was going to handle the whole match for us. <laughs> we won't go there. We won't talk too much about that. But so that was, we were looking at that saying, all right, that's. Well, we get all that taken care of, then the remaining money is all we don't need a match because it's it's all it's right, right there. Right there. Yeah. So so yes, there is matching funds, and again, you know, we could look at um, my opinion on the funding that's still available for the the Sucker Brook fund. I think there is a huge rationale for saying, all right, we should expand and look maybe beyond just Sucker Brook with some of that available funding to protect areas around, say, the intake pipe for the city of Canandaigua. Um, you know, or other systems that can showcase protection of, of the lake proper. So, you know, there's there's certain aspects that way as well that we could look at and, and provide that, that local match. Or, and we can provide local match. There's also restoration funds within that too. So if we're doing work, that could be some of the local match to help. So maybe a landscape is great to protect, but like we've done with these projects, like just say we bought the five and 20 landscape and didn't do any restoration work there. A yeah. little bit of benefit. But by being able to convey that flow out of Sucker Brook during those storm events and get it into the 20, 25 acre area that it normally would not, that's the huge bang for the buck. That's the huge water quality benefit we get by restoring the landscape and, and enhancing its water quality value. So, um, so there's funding in that grant to do that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So. Getting back to the septic, mm -hmm. uh, how meaningful has that been? Have we discovered a lot of uh, potential violations? Yeah. Or not? Talking with Tyler, um, yeah, he's finding a lot of systems that, you know, especially the time of property deed transfer, you know, is the time where we require the upgrades of systems that are not in failure per se, but are not um, at the highest functional value. So the goal of these uh, the regulations is to get those up there. And the nice thing about doing it at the time of property deed transfer is, you know, the money is most liquid, you know, the banking institutions involved, they want an inspection anyway. So this formalizes that inspection and then says, okay, buyer and seller, you guys figure out how you want to divvy out the, the cost for um, upgrading the system. Um, the nice thing is for the towns, quite honestly, you're benefiting your new customer you know, your new resident, you're making sure that they have a system that's in place that's going to be functional and they, they know what they're getting into. So that... How about the inspection within, what's it, 200 feet of the lake? Yeah, those five-year inspections, Tyler's been doing a lot of those. And, and he's uncovered a lot of problems. Yeah, he's, he's definitely uncovered uh, a bunch of uh, systems that are requiring upgrades or will require upgrades at the time the property be transferred. And, you know, a lot of folks. And then there was some small grant funding out there that has gone away, but to help upgrade those systems as Is well. Is five years too long of a time to um, I don't think so. schedule the inspections? You know, I, I, we chose that five years, um, and some places that have had that regulation have mm -hmm. looked at it and said they've been able to go to the 10-year level yeah. of inspections. Yeah, because, you know, as long as the, the system... Um, is functioning properly and, and one of the things on these aerobic treatment units these alternative systems they do require 
annual maintenance. So the law does say in there as well is that those maintenance records must come back to the town okay. as well as to, to verify that they have been maintained. So uh, annual maintenance, is, is that the uh, septic tank needs to be... Uh, well, typically it's an aerobic treatment unit, so really making oh, sure the aeration yes. system is functioning properly to remove the bacteria, um, making sure that the infiltration units are functioning properly. So it's it's really it's that aspect. So, you know, the conventional tank leach field system is a, you know, a, a pretty low maintenance aspect. It's making sure the tank is pumped every three to five years and is functioning well and the distribution system is working fine. Kevin, something you just said, most of the complaints that I'm aware of that we get relative to the septic law are either from the sellers or representative of the seller. Yeah, mm -hmm. almost completely and they can be pretty vocal yeah <laughs> especially by the time they get to me but yeah. uh yeah it's it's <laughs> traditionally it's the seller that's yeah. complaining about that because they found a problem yes uh, yeah. 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 that is that's that, that is. <clears throat> he uses the term universal is it mostly by the lake no no Actually, I think a lot of the complaints that I've heard the most complaints about are nowhere near the lake right. uh, because our law is kind of wide. Um, and so you have septic systems that really, who knows how long they've been there, right? You know, and you've got to transfer a property. The other one where we're finding issues with so many uh, short-term rentals, and now that we have the rental law get overloaded on the septic systems, we're discovering issues relative to that as they're renewing those. Mm -hmm. So how's that going? That the rental law is going well. Yeah. So we've. Uh, We've, we've ramped up the company as now, we changed the process, so the company is now sending out notices, so we're sending uh, that we've hired to help us regulate in terms of making sure that all these short-term rentals are registered. And so um, they send the notices out directly and then the people come in and claim why they are or not a short-term rental and then we go through the, that process. But um, we know of uh, post-pandemic, um, there was a very sizable increase in the number of LLCs owning single-family homes all over the town of Canandaigua in short-term rentals. I think well over 200. 200 I I plus. Mm -hmm. And um, a <coughs> fair number of those are on septic systems. And so this is, you know, we start to see issues mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we're having those conversations. Mostly in the upland, as you were talking about, yeah. upland from the lake, the view of the lake, but upland on the septic system. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned Sunnyside. How do they get? Are they all holding tanks there? Mostly holding tanks. That's part of the reason why the law isn't as mm -hmm. important there. Is most of the systems down there are, are holding tanks. Yeah. Um, are they all seasonal mostly down there? Mm, there's a couple. Half half, there's like or? 25 or so total down there on Sunnyside, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think um, most are seasonal, but I think a few. A few yeah, stay there. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're past our. You were only going to talk for half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Great questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your time. Oh, absolutely. That's a great group. I take it you are you advocate for the purchase of the MSM property. <laughs> oh, no, he, he off. At you the right know? price, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you think it would be beneficial for uh, for the lake. Is I it, do. Is it well, does it protect the lake? It, it, quite honestly, what I said at the town board meeting was as long and you know, I, there was somebody who had said, Well, it's a f false choice. Well, to me, Towns have to make choices. We are not with unlimited funds. So it's just making sure the pie from a revenue standpoint, <coughs> either wherever the money's coming from, is there to help make the right purchase at the right reasonable price. Because you also don't want to set the market at such a high level that right. the town is willing, we'll pay anything yeah, to, you fair. know. So it's looking at that and looking at, you know, going through the mechanisms to make that right and making sure to stay on lake and making sure that there's good partners involved to, to do all that. And it just, you know, my concern was if all of a sudden we used all of the open space funds, we use all the reserve funds, the ARPA funds, whatever, to on that one project, we're kind of hamstrung, you know, to do not fully. The town's got a lot of resources. But you have a lot of competing interests and a lot of things that have to be accomplished. So it's looking at that and saying, okay, yes, that 485 feet, you know, that would be awesome. That's why 
early on, it was, hey, we can put a substantial amount of our grant funding towards that to help the town do this. I thought it was a great concept. But there's so many other opportunities out there that could have huge bang for the buck return in terms of water quality benefits that we just have to make sure that what's done there doesn't preclude or substantially preclude the town from doing a lot of these other things. That was my big concern point was looking at the price escalation yeah, and, and looking at that. And I understand so, that and I understand why the town board, you know, is looking at that. But don't you believe that not purchasing the property actually could is an invitation for more um, difficulty for the lake because um, it's right next to a marina and right. you know what they really want to expand or somebody yeah, I, mean, it's it's, I think we've, we've been down that road yeah, I think we're I know, pretty we confident have, yeah. there you know that shoreline again this is might be where the shoreline regulations and the shoreline guidelines and, and those kind of things you know are important in saying okay yeah, it's great that you have shoreline here but you have guardrail you have a 25 yes, foot drop yes, exactly. that, that you know it precludes and really do we want do we want cuts in the guardrail do we want to have you know walkways going across to get to a multiple docking systems and i think that's where we would look at and say okay you know from a holistic standpoint is the county going to allow it is the town going to allow this you know at that level of site plan review um and is it does it make sense so i think a large majority of that um, northern 400 plus feet you know, will could highly stay forested as it is even if it were to be you know worst case scenario it were to be sold would i much rather see it be permanently protected for sure yes. absolutely yeah. absolutely but it's got to be the right price mm -hmm. that's i guess that's my take on it just and again the yeah. counterpoint in i think in the original resolution or whatever it is you have two appraisals and a big there's X number of percent of part, you get a third. So the cost shouldn't be the issue because there aren't any other parcels that are ever going to be available of that size. Mm -hmm. And the obligation to the residents of the town yep. who overwhelmingly have said we need more access, including those folks uphill who might have an easement down there, I think the the project is priceless mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity yeah. that is gone forever and there ain't no more and it's a shame that the town of Candigua has got the schoolhouse and Onanda and nobody in between yeah no but I agree it's, it's uh, definitely a you know and, and yeah. that you have to think of future yeah. generations yeah. and there we're not our population is not shrinking uh, and they have to think of future generations and access and it will without it it will increase the them and us routine and you saw yes. the feedback from the wealthy folks oh yeah when we were talking about titchener point yep you know, i agree the nimbies of the world um i just you know again i, I agree with you that's why it, i think it, it would it be a really priceless and, and yes. this cost issue Future generations will say that town board stood up and did the right thing. The, the, the issue with that property is it's nasty. There's it no question. The usefulness it of is it. nasty, yeah. nasty yeah. property, yeah. but to preserve it in light yeah. use yeah. is certainly possible. Yeah, I emailed you this morning. Okay. Yeah. So let's see what happens tomorrow at ordinance. It's the same as Westlake Road. Yeah, it's the same situation. There was a guardrail down there in front of the beach years ago. Yeah, there was a beach. Okay. On Butler Place. Schoolhouse Beach. Schoolhouse school school across the yeah. road. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, very narrow. Yeah. Were you talking about 25, 30 feet as opposed to about a eight foot? Yeah, yeah right. Uh, okay. I, for, it's uh, nasty. Yeah, we're gonna Nobody wrap up. will deny it's yeah. a nasty, challenging parcel, yeah. but it's all that's available. Okay. Yeah. And no, ever going to be available.